welcome to everybody. Welcome to everybody to uh, this uh, special session of the International Symposium of Economic Thought. Today, in this special session, we have Professor Harald Hagemann, Professor Emeritus of Economic Theory at the University of Ohnheim in Germany. And he's going to deliver a very interesting uh, lecture about Joseph Schumpeter and his uh, theory of capitalist and in particular, the Great Depression. So thank you for accepting the invitation. Thanks to Sema for inviting me to chair this uh, session with Professor Hagemann. And Professor, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks Sema for inviting me and thanks for your introduction, Paolo. Uh, I, for time reasons, I focus on Schumpeter's views on the Great Depression where you can uh, make relatively clear and discuss his views on capitalist development as it is announced in the title. Yeah. Uh, now, interestingly, some years after the outbreak of the Great Depression, in an article written in 1934, depressions can be learned from past experience. Schumpeter states in 1934, there's no reason to despair. Four years after the Great Depression have started. Why did Schumpeter arrive at such a conclusion when the United States and other countries had not yet overcome the depression with its disastrous economic, but also particularly in Europe, disastrous political consequences? Schumpeter's answer is clear. This is really at the bottom of the recurrent troubles of capitalist society. They are but temporary. They are the means to reconstruct each time the economic system on a more efficient plan. But they inflict losses while they last, drive firms into the bankruptcy court, throw people out of employment before the ground is clear and the way paved for a new achievement of the kind which has created modern civilization and made the greatness of this country, in that case, United States, where he was living at the time. Now, uh, he is well known for his notion of the process of creative destruction, which only comes in as a special term in chapter seven of his best-selling book, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy in 1942. However, the ideas, the basic ideas of this process of creative destruction, although not yet the term were already there three decades before when he published the theory of economic development in its German original. Now, creative destruction for Schumpeter is an integral part of the evolutionary process in a capitalist system and affects business cycles and economic growth alike. For Schumpeter, he always was talking of business cycles. Growth theory was not so well developed at this pre-World War II period. And what we will call growth cycles, contractive cycles, the long one, which fascinated Schumpeter after its publication in the 1920s, uh, was also considered by him as a business cycle, although a very long one. So Schumpeter considered this process of creative destruction as the essential fact about capitalism since the Industrial Revolution. And this process as a whole works prominently or insensuously, in the sense that there's always either a technological revolution or an absorption of the results of the revolution, both together forming what are known as business cycles. Now one can say Schumpeter in 1914 wrote already an early article based on a lecture he gave at Harvard on the wave-like movement of capitalist development. For him, it was completely unimaginable to have a kind of Solovian steady state growth model. For him, the long run growth process of the capitalist economy and cyclical fluctuations were an integral whole. Capitalist development was not imaginable for him without cyclical fluctuations. And this is important to understand why recessions or even what he considered depressions had some permanent role uh, or positive role to play. According to him, the process of liquidation and reallocation of productive resources taking place in the recession 
and particularly in the depression phase, is not only an essential and unavoidable characteristics of capitalist evolution, but it's also necessary and finally even beneficial for long-run development. Interestingly, in this respect, Schumpeter's argument and reasoning had much in common with the one by Werner Sombart. Werner Sombart was a lifelong rival who wrote three volumes of uh, his book Mo on modern capitalism, which until today was not yet translated into English, but I know that there's a project underway financed by INET to translate these roughly 2,000 pages from German into English. And this, when the third volume was published in 1927, Schumpeter wrote a long review article. Sombart was a kind of lifelong rival and he was instrumental that Schumpeter did not get an appointment as professor at the University of Berlin. Both capitals, first Vienna and then Berlin, avoided to uh, appoint professor, uh, Schumpeter professor at their universities. But in this particular view on the role of depressions, they have uh, similar ideas. I quote uh, from Zambard's Modern Capitalism, uh, where he emphasizes the selective role of economic crisis, which only the fittest entrepreneurs will master. However, a mastering among entrepreneurs and firms takes place. Only the strongest remain alive. Everything rotten, idle, weak, which was floating along in times of prosperity, disappears. The able, viable is preserved. In other words, uh, in great boom periods or uh, prosperity periods, almost every idiot can make profits. <laughs> like, let's say, in the new economy boom of the late 1990s. But only in economic crisis, it will turn out who is able as an entrepreneur. And there is a remarkable parallel between Schumpeter and Zombard in their what you may call Darwinian view of the survival of the fittest entrepreneurs in periods of depressions, but also in their emphasis on the beneficial role of economic fluctuations for long run development. Uh, Depressions have a kind of selective function in eliminating uh, uh, those entrepreneurs which are unable and uh, are not fit uh, for the capitalist economy. So somebody, for example, writes, blessing over blessing, which flows for capitalism from the presence and the process of expansion conjunction. Now, coming back to Schumpeter, who shares these views, it seems to be the case, and it was quite often stated in the literature, even by Paul Samuels, and I have a quote at the end of my presentation, uh, that with regard to economic policy, Schumpeter seems to have a clear anti-interventionist stance, and in this respect, sides more with his Austrian compatriots, Hayek and Mises, who are well known as uh, contra uh, uh, as rivals and you may say even enemies of Keynes or the new dealers in the Great Depression of the 1930s. So Schumpeter writes, depressions are not simply evils which we might attempt to suppress, but perhaps undesirable forms of something which has to be done, namely adjustment to previous economic change. Most of what would be effective in remedying a depression would be equally effective in preventing this adjustment. And any artificial stimulus made with the best moral intentions to remedy the crisis finally would make things worse because it would interfere into the work of depressions to correct maladjustments and instead create new maladjustments of their own. And according to Schumpeter, even in the case of the two greatest depressions since the Industrial Revolution, the one which started in England in 1825 and the one in uh, the United States starting in 1873, 
but even in these cases of great depressions, recovery came of itself. So this refers to the fact as when you take these uh, quotations from Schumpeter, then it's quite clear that you can give him an anti-interventionist interpretation like uh, the position of uh, for which uh, Hayek and Mies, even more Mises were well known. And it's quite interesting if you read this best-selling book by Robert Heilbronner on the world of philosophers, where you have long chapters from Adam Smith, who was the topic before, to Keynes and Schumpeter. Heilbronner, who was a student at Harvard in the 1930s and was sitting in Schumpeter's lectures, he writes in the world of philosophers, but the students who attended Schumpeter's classes at Harvard in the late 1930s were regularly shocked to hear this expositor of capitalist growth declare with obvious enjoyment that depressions far from being unmitigated social evils were actually in the nature of a good cold douche for the economic system. So, uh, this was quite irritating for many that he, uh, Schumpeter gave a positive flavor to something which by the great majority of people uh, also outside and even more outside uh, the lecturing rooms or seminar rooms at Harvard uh, was considered as a very bad thing with a disastrous economic and political consequences. But Schumpeter always liked to provoke people even when he was pointing out the beneficial role of depressions. But this is not a complete or full picture, picture uh, of Schumpeter's position. You have to consider what he wrote between 1934 and the lower lectures which he gave at Boston, which were published in 1941, in many other short articles too. Where he says, on the one hand, that the function of the depression is to eliminate disproportionalities and rigidities, which would overcome even a recession. That is much necessary work of reorganization and adaptation, which is done. However, there exists the danger of a depression becoming pathological. And here one has to point out And that Schumpeter, in many publications, makes a distinction between a normal depression on the one hand and an abnormal or pathological one on the other side. And this abnormal depression has the consequence that liquidation destroys even many things which could and would have survived without it. And whereas the essential process of an economic crisis is not at all catastrophic, the excesses of speculation and loose banking methods make the things much worse than it would otherwise be the case. Now, if you think of the financial crisis from 2007 onwards, which uh, mutated into an economic crisis and what economic historians ca now call the Great Recession 2008, 9, 10, then these excesses of speculation and loose banking methods certainly have played a major role in the generation of this economic crisis, which was pointed out by Schumpeter for the Great Depression already. And he emphasizes that the losses and the destruction which accompany these abnormal causes of events they are meaningless and functionless. So in that case where of the pathological depression, where the, also the selective function becomes meaningless and functionless, there is justification of the various proposals for a prophylaxis and therapy of crisis, which chiefly rests with them. And the sound starting point for a remedial policy is the fact that even the normal, still more the abnormal depression implicates individuals who have nothing to do with the cause and the meaning of the cycle above all the workers. This is quite interesting, that statement, because Schumpeter uh, 
rightly could be considered as an extremely bourgeois uh, person uh, whose uh, uh, love society was an old Danube mon monarchy, uh, which did not exist anymore after World War I. So it's not often the case that he did uh, take care for the workers, but he has quite explicitly emphasized that particularly in a pathological depression with this great demand of unemployment, like in the United States, but also in Germany in the 1930s, affected the workers and the depression became functionless with these excesses. Now, he nuances his view when he points out that futile as it is to hope for miraculous cures, it is exactly as wrong to believe that the evils of depression are all of them inevitable and the only sound policy consists in doing nothing, which was more or less uh, the position of Hayek and Mises against Keynes in that period. The numerous problems which present themselves must be dealt with individually and patiently. And the kind of activity which is clamored for in such situations is likely to make matters worse. But all those features of depressions which spell widespread suffering and needless ways can be yet, yet taken care of, especially if a country has steadily improved its public finances during prosperity. Now we come to a very interesting point here where uh, Schumpeter's views are quite of actual importance if you think of the Euro crisis or uh, the Great Recession and the current COVID crisis and uh, where let's say the Maastricht criteria within the EU with regard to budget deficits play an important role. Schumpeter here makes a great distinction between countries which had a sound public finance already in preceding periods of prosperity, like is emphasizing for the United States for the decade preceding the present crisis, so for the 1920s, where when enough means are available and other means can be procured for an expenditure which will blot out the worst things without injury to the economic system, provided only that action on this line is taken promptly and followed up by equally sound fiscal habits as soon as recovery gets underway. So what you can really uh, uh, say with regard to Schumpeter, for him, it is essential to make a conceptual distinction between a normal and an abnormal uh, depression. In the normal depression, you should not interfere with the government but when there are excesses of the depression and the depression becomes pathological, as it would have been the case in the Great Depression uh, in 2008, 9, 10, or in the current COVID crisis, then government has to intervene. But the possibilities and options for countries which had a sound public finance in better economic periods are greater to make deficits in such a crisis than in those countries where, let's say, where you have already 200% or more of uh, GDP as a budget, uh, as a general public debt. And under such circumstances, like the Great Depression, it's quite clear that Schumpeter neither adhered to laissez-faire positions, nor did he join forces with the advocates of austerity policy. And he was a very fierce critic, even uh, from Harvard in the mid-1930s against this austerity policy which had been done by Chancellor Brüning in the years between 1930 and 32, which contributed to the failure, economic and then political failure of Weimar Germany. It was a disastrous political consequence of bringing the Nazis or contributing to bringing the Nazis to power. So it basically agrees more with Keynesian advocates of government deficit spending as an effective remedy to overcome the danger of such a vicious downward spiral in a period of deflation when investment and consumption decisions are postponed in the case of elastic price expectations.
And this he made also very clear in the new chapter which he added to the second edition of his Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy in 1947 on the consequences of the Second World War. Schumpeter was not a great fan of stagnation uh, theories as they were made by Alvin Hansen or uh, Keynes. But what you may say that the true objection, as Schumpeter is pointing out, is not against income generating government expenditure in emergencies once they have arisen, but to policies that create the emergencies in which such expenditure imposes itself. And what he has as a kind of embryonic form, but not so well developed as it was some years later done by Swedish economists from the middle of the 1930s onwards, the, the idea or the argument of a balanced budget over the cycle so that you have room for budget deficits in depression years, particularly in abnormal or excessive depressions, and, and, but you should make then budget surpluses in boom periods or prosperity periods. This is quite important. And there is a remarkable time consistency in Schumpeter's argument with regard to economic policy. For example, he had a controversy already in 1926-27, so before the outbreak of the Great Depression with Gustav Kassel in Germany uh, about governmental intervention and pointed out uh, uh, the role of the government or the state to overcome a deadlock of the economy. Uh, but emphasizing that in a previous prosperity phase, a budget surplus should be accumulated. Now, let me come uh, to the end. Uh, Paul Samuelson, in one of his very last articles, made a statement which was wrong. Samuelson was one of the greatest economists, surely, of the second half of the 20th century. But in this statement, which he made in, the, in 2015, so published uh, after his day, he pointed out Schumpeter was such a bad depression macroeconomist. Indeed, he was a very bad one, as bad as 1931 Hayek, at the prime age of 51, in the ludicrous book by several Harvard senior professors, where they took an anti-Keynesian position. Schumpeter praised the Great Depression as a healthy catharsis of the economic system. This was a garish, uncreative version of what 1942 Schumpeter later called creative capitalist destruction, judges Samuelism. But Samuelism was wrong in putting uh, Schumpeter in the same corner, which the next speaker would have liked, Stefan Kurz, who is the chairman of the German Hayek Society. He was not in the same corner with Hayek and Mises, not intervening at all in the Great Depression, but in that particular situation of a pathological depression, more siding with Keynes, but emphasizing always, maybe in contrast to some wider Keynesians later, uh, sound fiscal policy over the cycle. So he considered budget deficit in a depression as necessary. And it would therefore wrong to believe that the evils of depression are all of them inevitable, and that the only sound policy consists in doing nothing. And in some sense, in the current current COVID crisis, where in most leading countries in the world, you do not have Keynesians or social democrats in government, there is governmental interventions to fight against the excesses of uh, such a crisis. But it, the room for maneuvering would be larger in those countries which had a smaller public debt, uh, like in the United States in the 20s, than let's say countries from Argentina uh, to Greece. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Hagemann. This was really interesting. You really succeeded in casting light on this very ambiguous uh, expression by Schumpeter, the creative destruction, because beyond the analogy or the metaphoric use of uh, this expression, I always found it really ambiguous and you at least succeeded in showing, I mean, the deep, deep uh, 
and sometimes contradiction because, of course, if you use words like, uh, as you were saying, essential and non uh, unavoidable or necessary, these are very deep philosophical <laughs> statement about uh, the, the working of history. So if it is unavoidable, of course, there is no freedom in any sense. So and it cannot but be that way. So uh, this is the logic of, I mean, necessity, not the logic of freedom. So therefore, I mean, one may object uh, if it is necessary, if it is unavoidable, if it is essential or whatever you say, using this kind of philosophical terms, then why you, Schumpeter, are, are you speaking? You cannot do anything about that. It's that and you cannot avoid it. <laughs> on the other hand, it seems to, on this second part of your presentation, you show that it seems that Schumpeter allowed for a little bit of, you know, uh, space for state intervention, and therefore he should have also rejected this kind of strong philosophical statement in terms of necessity. It seems like a kind of historical necessity. So this is my only kind of very short remark, but the time is very short. So anyway, That's thank a, you. Just a short answer. Uh, Schumpeter made this conceptual distinction between a normal and an abnormal or pathological depression. This is even a little bit easier in theory, although not so easy at all. Uh, but uh, Axel A. Neufeld, for example, he wrote an article in 73 on effective demand failures where he developed the corridor concept. When you are within the corridor, so not too far away from a kind of Bayesian equilibrium, then the self-adjusting process of a market economy would work. But when you are outside the corridor, then you have uh, accumulating uh, uh, distance from the equilibrium. But then the problem comes up, how to define the borderline of the corridors. So to agree when you are within or when you are without the corridor, and this will remain, uh, I think, a topic for controversies. There might be clear issues like the 1930s or the current COVID crisis, where there's a great agreement that you are in a great depression, a pathological one, and the government has to intervene. But there are, of course, intermediate positions where, let's say, Keynesians and Hayekians would have different views on the subject. And Thank you so much. And thanks again to Sema and the organizer for this really wonderful special session. And of course, thanks to Professor Hageman for this 